Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to the webinar on data visualization for intangible cultural heritage and introduction to uh, the concept. My name is Kate Rieder and I am a researcher, innovative tourism, also a lecturer at Thomas More University of Applied Sciences. And today we'll discuss the concept of intangible cultural heritage, um, its significance, as well as the importance of interactive data visualization in trying to understand the concept uh, of intangible cultural he heritage and its very diverse practices. So what is uh, on the agenda for today? First of all, what does heritage entail? What is it actually? And then afterwards, we'll take a deep dive into that concept of intangible cultural heritage or ICH. A third point on the agenda is um, the milestone for ICH, of course, the 2003 convention and its three instruments. And then afterwards, we'll move on to um, where ICH meets uh, big data visualization. Now, as a starting point, what is heritage actually? What does it entail? According to the Belgian Heritage Organizations, heritage is a collective term. It stands for everything that we inherit from previous generations and what we consider uh, that is worth preserving. Um, we distinguish three types of heritage. First of all, there's immovable heritage um, with elements such as buildings and monuments. There's also movable heritage, um, such as archaeological finds, works of arts, objects, photos, and so on. But there's a third type of heritage, intangible heritage. Of course, um, also including less tangible aspects of heritage, but it's this intangible layer of culture that is so very important to communities, to cultural identities, and to tourism, of course. Now, Intangible cultural heritage. What is it, what does it mean? What is its definition? Um, ICH or living heritage, which is sometimes used as a synonym for intangible cultural heritage, uh, refers to all of these practices, those um, uh, skills, representations, expressions, um, know-how that is transmitted from one generation to another generation within communities and that is continuously created, recreated, and transformed by those communities, depending on their environment and their interaction with nature and history. So it's very much intangible because it lies essentially within the human spirit um, and it's very much captured in the minds and the hearts of people who practice it. Um, it is transmitted and it's learned through immersion in a certain practice and it doesn't necessarily require a specific place, a specific location, or uh, tangible uh, aspects, tangible objects. It is very much cultural. It provides communities with a sense of identity, um, and that is what culture does. And it's very much heritage because it is transmitted from one generation to another generation. Now, does that mean that all intangible heritage practices should always be safeguarded, that uh, they should always be kept alive, that they always need to be revitalized at any cost? Not at all. Eh? Um, intangible heritage um, is also referred to as living heritage because, as is the case with any living body, intangible cultural heritage practices also follow a certain life cycle. Uh, because of that, some elements of practices or practices uh, might disappear. Um, it's a very dynamic type of heritage as well, uh, rather than it being frozen in time. It's very dynamic and it's alive. And it might be that certain types and certain forms of intangible cultural heritage, despite their potential huge economic value, are sometimes no longer considered as relevant or meaningful to a certain community. And then it's very okay uh, to uh, let go of that intangible cultural heritage practice. Um, when talking about protecting heritage um, in terms of tangible heritage, we often refer to concepts in terms such as conservation and preservation. It's very much uh, talking about uh, keeping tangible aspects safe, protecting them so that future generations uh, can be amazed by them. 
Now, when it comes to protecting intangible cultural heritage, we rather refer to the term safeguarding. Um, safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage versus the conservation and preservation of tangible elements of heritage um, is a very uh, different uh, approach, um, entails a very different dynamic. It also highlights a different set of stakeholders because safeguarding is very much about empowering communities behind intangible cultural heritage practices to be able to provide them with resources and training to empower them to transmit and recreate their practice for them to be able to document the practice, uh, being able to make a living out of it, training, guiding them to set up certain tourism activities. Very important, always with the approval within the boundaries of that specific um, intangible cultural heritage uh, community. Very important to mention as well when it comes to intangible cultural heritage and the work that is being done, um, it's uh, that 2003 convention for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage. Um, 2003, quite recently, but uh, however, intangible cultural heritage has always been there. It is not something new, it has always been present. People have always practiced rituals, they have always celebrated certain festive events, they have always crafted things. Um, however, defining it and labeling it as intangible cultural heritage, uh, the increased attention towards it and towards its importance, that is quite new. Certainly in comparison to the importance of tangible manifestations of culture and artifacts, monuments, buildings. However, intangible cultural heritage has been one of UNESCO's priorities in the cultural domain recently, um, as it very much promotes uh, cultural diversity and dialogue. UNESCO, of course, United Nations Agency, with a very specific mandate in culture, plays a crucial role when it comes to cultural heritage, including intangible cultural heritage. And it very much works towards the protection and safeguarding of cultural heritage uh, and the promotion of cultural diversity as a force for dialogue and development. It also encourages international cooperation and knowledge sharing. Now, back in 1972 already, there was a game-changing convention concerning the protection uh, of the world's cultural and natural heritage, um, thus creating the world heritage sites. Now, this convention was the world's first blueprint when it comes to the conservation of sites that are considered to be of outstanding universal value. However, that 1972 convention mainly focused on tangible aspects of heritage. Fast forward to 2003, the year in which the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage was launched. Once again, a true game changer, but now in the field of ICH. Because this convention, that it's, uh, is the international community's first binding multilateral instrument that is really intended to protect or safeguard intangible cultural heritage and to raise awareness about this type of heritage. It's very much a, a tool to support communities and practitioners in their ICH practices. Its goal, in other words, is really to stimulate and incite countries to care about uh, their ICH and to look after it. Now, there are three instruments that exist to strengthen that 2003 convention message and to help operationalize its goals. There's a UNESCO representative list of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity. There's the Register of Good Safeguarding Practices that highlights practices that have implemented certain successful safeguarding measures um, and examples of how the involved stakeholders surmounted and faced challenges that intangible cultural heritage elements um, have to deal with regarding the transmission of their heritage. So uh, this list and its examples very much serve as useful lessons and models that can be adapted and implemented to different uh, contexts. A third instrument is the list of intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent safeguarding. So um, it deals with um, intangible cultural heritage practices that are threatened by a number of possible factors, such as a declining number of practitioners, impact climate, uh, impact of, of climate change, 
um, and so on. Um, threats for which um, awareness raising is, is required, counteractive measures are required, and of course, international cooperation is required. Now, in total, these three lists contain 676 elements corresponding to uh, 140 countries. Now, where um, intangible cultural heritage meets data visualization. So um, intangible cultural heritage, of course, concerns a type of heritage with its own set of characteristics, with its own dynamics. It is very much subjective, it's layered, it is intangible. Um, so therefore, intangible cultural heritage might be a bit harder to uh, grasp and to uncover. And this is where UNESCO's interactive data visualization comes in. Um, their dive into intangible cultural heritage interface uh, visualizes intangible cultural heritage elements uh, inscribed to the UNESCO lists of the 2003 convention. And it very much offers a great way to explore various elements of the visualized intangible cultural heritage practices. Now, an additional benefit is that it illustrates in a very straightforward way the range of diversity and interconnectedness of the intangible heritage practices, allowing the viewer to really discover, learn, and grasp the more complex notion of intangible heritage. And that is, of course, an advantage because in turn, that may stimulate an increased sense of awareness uh, and valuation of this type of heritage. It could have been a flat Excel data file, but the story of intangible heritage really detangles through this interactive tool. Now, there are multiple entry points from uh, which you can start exploring the vast amount of listed intangible cultural heritage elements. And we'll have a look at each of those entry points uh, but let's start off with the domains of the convention. Now, intangible cultural heritage may entail a lot. Um, it can range from boat building, old dialects, traditional songs over rites of passage in a group uh, of, of people's lives uh, to the art of textile making. However, UNESCO defines five domains or subsets uh, of uh, intangible cultural heritage, which may serve as a guidance. Um, and we'll go through each of the domains um, a bit deeper. So the first domain is the domain of um, oral traditions, expressions um, with 330 listed intangible cultural heritage elements. Now, this domain of oral traditions and expressions entails a very wide variety of spoken forms, including um, nursery rhymes, uh, poems, prayers, chants, um, and so on. So these traditions and expressions, they are very much used to pass on knowledge, cultural values, social values, as well as the more collective memory of a community. Sometimes oral traditions and expressions, they are practiced by an entire community, while in other cases, it's very much limited to a certain part of a community, such as only for women, only men, or only the elderly. Performing these traditions and expressions is often a very highly specialized skill um, and these professional performers or storytellers, as they're also called, they are regarded with uh, much respect and they are actually seen often as guardians of the collective memory of a community. It's a very fragile domain as well because um, whether it continues or not is very much dependent on this undisrupted generational chain, uh, passing traditions and expressions on from one generation to uh, another. Um, of course, this domain is increasingly threatened by factors such as urbanization, migration and industrialization. And often modern mass media um, may significantly alter or even replace traditional forms of, of expressions and traditions. Let's have a look at one of the examples within this domain. Um, that's the case of the Palestinian Hikaye, which is a tradition um, that is mainly practiced by elderly women. Um, it very much entails the narration of fictitious tales that have evolved over centuries um, and often deal with 
current concerns of uh, society in uh, the Middle Eastern um, Arab countries um, and family issues as well. Many tales actually describe women being torn between duty and desire. Um, and Ikaye is usually narrated in a Palestinian dialect and at home during winter evenings, uh, during spontaneous events. And it's attended by small groups of women and children. Men rarely attend Hikaye because that is uh, considered as inappropriate. Now, a second domain of intangible cultural heritage is, of course, music and the performing arts, with 347 listed practices. It entails a very wide range of expressions, ranging from vocal and instrumental music over dance to theater and beyond. Music, of course, and perhaps one of the most universal uh, types of, of performing arts, arts. It's found in every society, in uh, a lot of contexts as well. Uh, can be sacred, can be profane, can be classical, can be popular, um, closely connected to work or even entertainment, of course. It also um, may include a rather political or um, economic dimension. Eh? It can be on the, the uh, history of a community. It can um, entail the story of a powerful person or even play a very important role in an economic transaction. Performing arts, then we're talking in a lot of cases about theater, um, combining acting, singing, dance, music, dialogue, and so on. Um, what is important to mention is that these performances are not merely performances for an audience, that they play a crucial role in a certain culture or in a, a societal context. Um, of course, we'll, we're talking about a field of um, intangible cultural heritage, but it often uh, also includes tangible aspects, uh, musical instrument, masks, uh, scenery and props. This domain, like every other domain, is uh, threatened by a number of factors. Uh, um, cultural practices are increasingly becoming standardized because of globalization. Many traditional practices are abandoned. Um, in a lot of cases, this domain is also one of the key features of cultural promotion to attract visitors. And that might be positive, eh? might bring in more visitors, might bring in um, revenue for a certain community, offer a true window onto its culture, or even revive old uh, traditions um, and practices. But it also may result in practices that have been changed, have been altered in order to cater to the needs and the wishes of the tourism sectors, uh, sector and its visitors. And that often results in a reduced or adapted show that only shows the highlights and um, that very much distorts the practice um, itself. Let's have um, a look at one of the examples within uh, the domain of music and the performing arts. Um, that is the case of uh, the Fizoko uh, multi-part singing in southwestern Bulgaria, very uh, a nice example. Um, in the past, these Fizoko songs, also known as the summer songs, they were sung outdoors by women working in the fields while harvesting, for example. And while doing that work, a group of women called out those Fizoko so songs from one field and a second group replied from another field. The third domain of intangible cultural heritage is the domain of the social practices, the rituals and the festive events containing 444 elements uh, today. It's perhaps one of the biggest domains of intangible cultural heritage uh, because it concerns a very wide variety of forms, carnivals, processions, um, births, weddings, uh, funeral rituals, and so on. Now, these activities, um, they may structure the lives of communities and groups uh, and may in turn reaffirm their identity, uh, in, reaffirm the identity of those who practice the practices as a, a group or as a society. These um, social, ritual and festive events, they may have a lot of purposes, 
They may help to mark the passing of the seasons, um, events in the agricultural calendar, the stages in a person's life. They often take place at special times or special places. Um, they are very much linked to a community's worldview um, and, of course, its perception of its own history and uh, memory. They may vary from very uh, small scale gatherings to very large scale private or public celebrations, commemorations. And in some case cases, these rituals, practices, uh, they might be restricted to certain members of a community, uh, such as burial uh, ceremonies or funerals. Um, and in other cases, some festive events, they are part of public life and they are open to all, such as carnivals or events to mark the new year. Of course, this domain of intangible cultural heritage is threatened uh, because of processes such as migration, over-commercialization, individualization, and globalization, because they are strongly related to um, and affected by the changes in society and, of course, the participation of practitioners. And a good example of um, this domain, uh, an intangible cultural heritage practice in this domain, is the case of um, the Leuven uh, age set ritual repertoire in uh, Belgium. Let's have a look at that one. So this is actually a very interesting one. It's a 10 year long rite of passage in a man's life leading up to his 50th birthday. So men who were born in the same year are grouped together in an age set. And as from the age of 40, men living in or around Leuven uh, take part in uh, a lot of social, cultural, philanthropic ag activities, ceremonies. And that all culminates at the age of 50 with a big celebration in the city central park. The goal of this uh, ritual, this practice, is very much to celebrate and to embrace life during the decade before the, the 50th birthday and, of course, beyond. Um, each age set really shares these uh, values of solidarity, friendship, commitment to their fellow um, members of their age set uh, and, of course, towards their city. And within every age set, differences regarding social status, religious or political beliefs, they are of no importance. The fourth domain um, of intangible cultural heritage is um, the domain of knowledge and practices uh, concerning nature and the universe and currently counts 245 elements listed. Now, this domain is represented by areas such as traditional ecological wisdom, indigenous knowledge, knowledge about local fauna and flora, traditional healing systems as well. Um, of course, these practices, they strongly influence the values and the beliefs uh, of, of a community um, and its identity and vice versa. Um, this domain is under threat from globalization. Traditional healing systems are, for example, increasingly replaced by pharmaceutical mass production. There is clearing of land. There is the impact of climate change that may result in the disappearance of sacred forest or the need uh, of, of, an, of a community to find uh, alternative sources for their practices. Um, a good example of um, a practice in this domain is the case of the Lum medicinal bathing in Soa Rigpa, which uh, concerns a practice of health and illness prevention and treatment uh, among Tibetan people in China. And the last domain is the one of um, traditional craftsmanship with 342 elements subscribed. So traditional craftsmanship can, of course, have many expressions such as clothing, such as jewelry, costumes, tools, um, rather decorative arts such as lace, uh, household utensils, music instruments and so on. So this domain of intangible cultural heritage has a very tangible outcome the crafts, of course, but the intangible cultural heritage focus is, of course, mainly concerned with those skills and that knowledge that is necessary and involved in craftsmanship rather than the craft products itself. Safeguarding this domain is mainly about making sure that craftsmen are very much encouraged to continue to produce their crafts and, of course, to pass on their skills and their knowledge to others. 
these necessary skills, they may range from being able to do very delicate work to rather robust tasks. Once again, like globalization, mass production uh, poses a major threat to the existence of traditional craftsmanship because those mass produced goods are often cheaper and produced way faster than goods that are manually produced. In addition to that, young people um, within communities often find that um, period of time uh, regarding the apprenticeship of the skill too demanding. At the same time, uh, concurrently, many people around the world do enjoy handmade objects that are imbued and that contain these um, cultural values, that passion, the knowledge um, that is necessary for the type of craftsmanship. Um, and it offers, uh, in a way, a softer alternative to those numerous mass-produced items that dominate global consumer culture. Let's have a look at an example uh, within the domain of traditional craftsmanship. Um, that is the example of, there are a lot of them. Um, let's have a look at the example of Petrikivka decorative painting as Ukrainian folk art. So the people within the of the village of Petrikivka in Ukraine, they decorate their living spaces, their household belongings, their houses and their musical instruments with a very specific style of ornamental painting that is very much characterized by natural elements. Um, it is an art that is very rich in symbolism. For example, a rooster stands for fire, for spiritual awakening. Um, and according to the belief, these paintings, they uh, serve to protect people from sorrow and evil. Um, it is practiced by um, an entire community, certain, certainly those, uh, the women of the community, women of all ages, um, they um, do practice this craftsmanship. Now, until now, we've mainly tackled um, intangible cultural heritage practices that can be categorized under one specific domain. However, in reality, what becomes truly evident from this visual as well is that most of those listed intangible cultural heritage practices, they contain features from multiple domains. Um, Let's take the example of traditional violin craftsmanship in Cremona in Italy. It's a very specific type of craftsmanship that is very famous for its ancient and traditional uh, process of crafting uh, instruments such as violins. Now, these craftsmen, they attend a specialized school and then become an apprentice in a local workshop where they, of course, continue to master and uh, perfect their violin making technique, which is, of course, a part of the domain of traditional craftsmanship. Now, on average, a violin maker only makes three to six instruments per year. And um, every instrument and every part of the instrument is made with a very specific type of wood, which is carefully grown, selected and prepared for this particular use. So it's a practice that is very much in touch with the natural materials that it makes use of. And it is thus also related to uh, the domain um, and practices on nature and the universe. No industrial materials are used in building the instruments. Now, the instruments that are made um, are of course not intended to be stored away somewhere in the workshop, but they are often used during musical performances, which of course, uh, results in the fact that it also has links with the domain of music and the performing arts and that often those instruments have a very significant meaning uh, and importance during social practices, rituals and festive events. So these domains, they truly form um, an important element um, in understanding the huge magnitude of intangible cultural heritage practices. It's very Important to note, however, that countries around the world make 
may use um, different subsets according to different cultural contexts. That's very much the case for uh, Belgium, for example, more specifically in Flanders, where um, the Dutch-speaking part of the country, the northern part, uh, where domains such as sporting games and gastronomy were added as they formed very important cultural assets. Now, a totally different entry point for our uh, intangible cultural heritage exploration um, is through biomes and natural resources. So once again, we need to go back to our definition on intangible cultural heritage. It mentions that those elements, those practices are transmitted within communities from one generation to another, but always depending on the environment and their interaction with nature and history. So in, in other words, environments, natural resources, the community surroundings, they form truly a very vital part of intangible cultural heritage practices. Now, this interactive tool manages to really visualize this strong bond between practices and biomes and natural resources. Let's have um, a look at a very illustrative case, the case of Takile and its textile art, which was inscribed to the representative list of ICH of humanity in 2008. Now, the island of Takile is located in uh, Lake Titicaca on the Peruvian High Andean Plateau. It's very much known for its textile art, which is produced as an everyday activity by uh, members of the community, regardless of their age. And it's also worn by all community members. Now, the people of Takile were relatively isolated from uh, the mainland until the 1950s. The notion of community is still very strong among them. Um, and what is special about this practice is that the weaving tradition goes back um, to ancient Inca civilizations. So it's very important when it comes to pre-Hispanic in Andean cultures. Fabrics are knitted, they are woven, um, and the most characteristic garment is the so-called chulo, which is a knitted hat with an ear flap. But there's also um, a calendar waistband, which is a wide woven belt depicting the annual cycles that are connected to ritual and agricultural activities. Um, Takile has a specialized school for learning the handicrafts, uh, which is, of course, very good when it comes to the viability and the continuity of this tradition. And tourism has contributed to the development of the local economy. The local economy is mainly dependent on textile and tourist trades. Um, and, of course, tourism is regarded as an effective way of ensuring that continuity of the tradition Rising demand, on the other hand, has led to significant cha significant changes in material, in production, and in meaning of the art. Um, in this case, of course, it is very much linked to the concepts of the mountains, inland wetlands, and agriculture as well. Now, um, in addition to uh, being a very powerful wealth of uh, knowledge, um, driver of cultural diversity, uh, of dialogue, intangible cultural heritage practices also form an important contribution when it comes to life on our planet in a sustainable and peaceful way. In other words, ICH practices are interlinked with the 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and their realization. Let's have a look at our Tequile textile art case and in what way it is related to those SDGs. There's of course a very clear link with SDG 8 on decent work uh, and economic growth because those local textile art is, um, is a crucial part of the community's local economy. In addition to that, we're talking about traditional craftsmanship that is locally and manually produced and because of that in close connection to its surrounding natural resources environment, it's a powerful driver for responsible consumption and production. And in addition to that, the Dakile textile art has been a driver of local development. There's a specialized school for learning the handicrafts, ensuring their safeguarding, which in turn adds to SDG for quality education. Now, we already discussed the way in which ICH is protected through safeguarding measures, uh, for example, uh, 
um, and empowering practitioners to be able to continue with their practice transmitted to others. Um, so there's a different approach than would be the case with tangible cultural heritage. Now, ICH has, once again, its own characteristics, its own dynamics, but it also has its own factors um, and uh, threats that could endanger it uh, and could endanger its existence. Bear in mind that the core of intangible cultural heritage are practitioners behind it with the knowledge, know-how and practices that they possess. Now, very useful um, when it comes to this tool is that based on the study of ICH nomination files, UNESCO actually identified 46 phenomena that threaten ICH practices, which are in turn grouped to um, nine categories. Now, this interactive graphic visualizes the currently 76 ICH practices that are on the list of the intangible cultural heritage in need of urgent, urgent safeguarding, um, together with the reasons why they are on that list. Now, the big ball, the bubble in the middle, um, the category in the middle, uh, labeled as weak in practices and trans transmission, corresponds to symptoms uh, applicable to all the listed intangible cultural heritage practices, while the other categories um, in the visual correspond to underlying factors, threats or risks. Now, a weakened practice or transmission um, of a practice can be the result of a few remaining aged practitioners, diminishing participation, decreased interest from young uh, potential practitioners, and those elements could in turn be a consequence of other negative influences. So those underlying factors, those risks, those threats to intangible cultural heritage can be very broad. They can range from negative attitudes towards the practice, including repressive policies, uh, conflicts such as war, uh, over decontextualization, uh, including factors such as touristification, over commercialization, which entails, of course, the modeling of a practice so that it caters to those needs of visitors and the tourism industry rather than to the needs of the community. And that, of course, leads to a loss of significance and meaning of the practice for the community and may distort the practice. Now, from another angle, um, industrialization, including uh, new products, new techniques, may alter or replace intangible cultural heritage, such as traditional craftsmanship, but also globalization of um, culture and, on, on the other hand, may push ICH practices aside because of new forms of entertainment or mass media. So all in all, this graphic does um, not only present us with a list of um, intangible cultural heritage that is endangered, it also raises awareness about what exactly endangers those valuable ICH practices. And in addition to that, it provides us with a great framework when it comes to understanding and discovering, cherishing global uh, intangible cultural heritage practices and their importance to who we are today, where we come from, and the road that we are heading towards. Thank you.